If you see the title slides, you know you're in the right place. Spotlight on cultural dance. And we kind of have it with a colon, Haka being what we're presenting today, because our plan is that we are going to have more featured cultural dances. And we're really going to start incorporate, incorporating lots of exciting um, things that don't generally get the coverage that they should. So I'm really excited to be here today with my co-presenter, Callie. And this is the second dance presentation we've done. So if you don't know me, my name is Louisa Higgins. So I'm the Arts Administrator for Riverside County Office of Education. And little no fun fact, um, I oversaw a program called Red Hot Ballroom for about 10 years. And I was an instructor for that three or four of those years. So I really do have a great passion for dance. I really love it. Not that I'm good at it. Um, it's, not, it's not about that for me. It's about the joy of movement and having fun. And so, you know, to do our finals and have 200 young people, you know, between the ages of like seven and 11 dancing. I'm incredible. having trouble hearing you. Am I low? Is my voice low? Let's see. What about now? Rebecca, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Callie? Yes. Okay, I'll just try and speak up. Grace, I'll try and speak up, okay? All right, and so I'd like to introduce my co-presenter, Callie. She is a dance teacher by day and Wonder Woman by night, and she's also just about to leave to go study in Columbia and bring back so much more culturally relevant experiences. So Callie, go ahead and say hi, please. Yes, hello. I'm super excited to be with you all. And I want to take a moment to thank Louisa and give her the props Callie, that she I can't hear you. Can't hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear her. I can hear clearly. Mm -hmm. Can, I can hear too. Louisa, can you hear me? Okay, can you try again? Yes, can you hear me? Hmm. Is anyone some, hearing her? Some people yes. can, but I still can't hear you. See, I'm not hearing her at all. It's okay. All right. All right, go ahead, Kelly. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Louisa for all of the opportunities that she brings to us, and she can't even hear me, um, but she's really opening a lot of doors for me, but also for our children and teachers, and she takes care of us as adults um, because we need the art too, so thank you, and my fun fact is that I ran a program for Riverside Unified to help Black students get on college track. And then I had the opportunity to start a dance program, career technical at Poly High School. So those things combined um, allowed me to be awarded the Fulbright and I'm off to Columbia for three months in February. So I'm, I'm really excited and grateful. That's amazing, glad to hear it. Okay, I think we're, I think we're doing okay, yeah. Okay. They're checking on me, making sure I'm up and running. I have the best team ever. <laughs> Okay, so the goals of the presentation today, this is what we're after. We want to introduce the history and origins of Haka dance, explain its cultural significance. We're going to have several videos. I think we have three or four videos that show it in action. And there is one video where it's you can do it along with the video to demonstrate Haka dance. And we're going to suggest some possible incorporations into dance or other class. So I believe, Callie, please go ahead and explain to us a little bit more about what Hakka dance is. Yes. Hakka is um, the same word in English and in Maori. Maori, the Maori people are in New Zealand, and it's often performed by a group with vigorous movements and stamping of the feet with ryth rhythmically shouted or chanted accompaniment. We see it a lot now, um, even in sports with Islanders, Samoans. Um, mm, could it be the computer? To, Let me see. To uh, um, introduce a game and intimidate their opponents. Or maybe get in the mood, <laughs> right? Yes. And although it's um, commonly associated with battle, with war, um, the Hakka dance 
has been performed by men and women, and it has multiple uses as we'll see in the presentation. Haka are performed to welcome distinguished guests or to acknowledge great achievements, occasions, or funerals. So we'll see um, an example of a wedding haka. And then as I mentioned in sports, and it was really interesting for me to see that it's not just associated with war, it has many functions. And due to the effort it takes to perform a haka and how it's built on respect, haka have been described as a Maori equivalent of chivalry. And the origins, they have an origin story as many cultural cultures do. And so uh, it has been thought of uh, uh, over time as specifically war dances, but the mythology places it as a celebration. And I think you'll see as we move into this, there's so much emotion um, to this art form. I think that really defines it. And so according to the creation story, there was a summer maid and a winter maid. And when one is coming, um, you could feel that in the air, you could feel that vibration and that energy. So the haka dance is very connected to that origin story. And so they talk about the phenomena, you know, on hot summer days, the shimmering atmosphere, that distortion of air is, the, is personified as, and I won't um, pronounce this correctly, but uh, the haka represents that, that phenomena. So when it's, if you think about that vibration and that energy comes from nature and they're trying to portray that in a dance. So a lot of that incredible energy that you see in it is coming from that origin story and from representing that phenomena. And I, I love this picture. This is, um, you know, uh, Callie was referencing in sports teams. And so this is the New Zealand team in 2014 uh, doing a victory dance to celebrate they had just won the World Cup. And it's a very famous picture. I was looking online earlier that you can actually order this. And so they have, they have just won, it's pouring rain, it's in Hong Kong and they're celebrating and they're doing this dance. So you can see this cultural dance exists in many different defining moments as dance does in many cultures, right? It's, it's something that we do to celebrate, we're excited, we're sad, we're honoring, we're, we're you know, celebrating the moment, we're right in the moment. Callie? So as I said, there are various types of haka and they include wakatu, weiwei, tutu, garu, and peru peru. The tutu nagari involves jumping from side to side, while in the wakutu, weiwei, no jumping occurs. Another kind of haka is performed without weapons. It's the nigari. The purpose is to motivate the warrior psychologically. Um, I, and I keep making the sports reference, but um, because I know a lot of athletes, we know how psychologically that's going to affect how you perform. The movements are very free and each performer is expected to be expressive of their feelings. And a lot of times in dance, we're looking at um, like arm and leg, leg movements or smiles, but we're gonna see some more of how even the facial expressions and the tongue is incorporated and how that builds energy into uh, the haka dance. And then war haka, uh, also called Peru Peru, were originally performed by warriors before a battle, proclaiming their strength and their prowess in order to intimidate the opposition. Various actions are employed in the course of the performance, including facial contortions, such as showing the whites of the eyes. So opening your eyes as big as you can, uh, the poking out of the tongue, and a wide variety of vigorous body actions, such as slapping the hands against the body and stomping the feet. And Louisa and I were talking about how at first it felt like um, the sticking out of the tongue was like this unique 
um, movement that we weren't used to, but I brought up how a lot of our pictures now when we're excited or we're playing or we're having fun with family, people do stick out their tongues now. So we're going to be thinking about like why we do that and what types of feelings are invoked when we see these pictures and when we're doing it too. So we have chanted words going along with the movement, a variety of cries and grunts. Haka can be understood as a kind of a symphony, which in the different parts of the body represent many instruments. So it's bringing it all together. And it's all parts, arms, legs, the voice, eyes, tongue, and the body combine to express courage. So this is where the intimidation comes in because the dancers have to be full of energy and intimidating. And we give off that confidence, right? When we see someone walking in confidence, we wonder where they get it from or what they're so proud of. So this is what they're trying to show to um, the other warriors. And these feelings are relevant to whatever occasion the dance is being performed in. Right. Or, yeah, I was just going to say, it's just as important. It could be really expressing annoyance or really expressing joy, depending on the situation. But certainly the war and the sports uh, style of dance go most together because of what's happening. And so if you are curious, you know, who are the Maori? Like, what is the background? You can see that these are an indigenous peoples um, from New Zealand. So they originated with the settlers from East Polynesia who arrived in New Zealand in several ways of waka, uh, which is another word for voyage. So this happened long ago in the 1300s. And after being in isolation for several centuries, they, they just, just developed their own distinctive culture. And so, and that's when we're talking about culture, it's your language, your mythology, your uh, visual arts, your performing arts. And so the Maori uh, evolved separately from other Polynesian cultures. And this is actually a pretty uh, recent photo where they are in um, traditional dress uh, and you can see all ages represented there. And if you're wondering where this is, if you're not familiar with the geography of it, so this is near, uh, and I don't want to misspeak and somebody jump in and correct me. I believe this is south of uh, Australia because I don't have the, the full map that shows it all. But you can see there's actually not one island, there's several islands. There's the North Island and also the South Island. So it is literally on the other side of the world from us, but it is you know fairly prevalent in certain situations. And our goal is to get more familiar with it and, and uh, welcome teachers into feeling comfortable with it and perhaps teaching it. So um, in addition to talking about the geography, I found it really interesting um, when Luisa and I decide to present about a style of dance, like we always try to find people who, who are familiar with the culture or the dance style or who actually perform it. And when I ask different people about Haka, like I have a friend in New Zealand, I have a friend who's um, in Australia, but from New Zealand, and they're like, they weren't as familiar and they were very distinctively telling me that is a Maori dance. So I just love how maybe we're not as familiar with the culture, but people from the region are familiar with the Maori. And I had the opportunity to interview my friend, Tony de Alessandro, who is in Vanuatu and very familiar with the Maori culture. He's lived all over the world. Vanuatu is near Fiji. And I asked him if the Hakka dance is religious because when we're teaching or performing or talking about dance, I always like to get that context and um, find out if it's something that's performed by other people or if it's specific to a religion. And he shared that it's like we said originally to intimidate opposing tribes, but it became a sign of each tribe. They had their own type of haka. So I think that's why we see it more now. And it's even used to welcome people to New Zealand um, and in the culture, they'll expect to see haka. And another question that I had 
was do women do the haka as well? And he shared that they do, but they have different movements. So I'm not sure if that will come up in our video that we have, but if you're interested in seeing a haka with men and women, you can email me and I know that I came across some. And it is offensive if the women do movements that are supposed to be specific to the men. Okay, so now we're getting get into showing you some examples. And this is uh, one from a film that features Jason Moma. And this is obviously in a um, getting ready to go to war, very intense and aggressive. So this is our first look at it. And we're gonna show you several different versions. And uh, let me know, Kelly, give me a thumbs up if the sound's coming through well, okay? I will. This isn't a raiding party, it's a whole army. Okay, this is our home. We are one, and we fight as one. <laughs> Prepare for battle. <laughs> Okay, so that is our first example. And I invite you to ask yourself, what do you notice? You know, did you see the protruding tongue and the bulging eyes? which isn't super common, but like Callie was saying, we, we do have that where we stick at our tongue and, and that happens, but not you know as a dance form um, in traditional Caucasian dance, originated dances that we know of. Are the warriors chanting or are they calling out? Does it seem designed to intimidate the enemy? I think Callie referenced it. Like it, it gets me riled up just watching it. Like it, I was it's, right, I get, yeah, it, like I feel it. And you know, of course, social and emotional learning is a big part of the arts. And so I just love that even in observing it, not participating, it starts to get you fired up. So that's the first example. Now this one is completely different and this is taking place at a wedding. And remember we said it's used to mark momentous occasions and keep your eye on the bride and her reaction over time because it starts and then it builds. And I think that is another aspect of the dance that we want to notice and be aware of.
that's so incredible. I'm not crying. You're crying. Right. I mean, that it just, it I'm blows emotional. Me away. Okay. So, it, it, I'm emotional as well. Karen says, I cry every time I see this video. Me too. I haven't watched it in a while, but you know, it starts out that the group is honoring them. Right. And then the groom is participating and the bride is participating. They're surrounded in love. And again, it, it's the intensity of that day. And if you think, you know, if you've been married, you think about like how that was one of the best days of your life. And you know, I wish I would have expressed it that strongly, you know, it was much quieter and more polite. And do you see, so what do you notice about this style of dance? Do you see the call and response happening, right? Because it starts up and then how do you, or how do you feel that the dance showed respect for the wedding couple? It, couple, it was an homage, right? It was, it was communicating with them through dance. And do you see the social and emotional aspects of the dance? I think that's a rhetorical question because it's so intense. It's so emotional and so beautiful. And I let think me just, it's really uh -huh. incredible that such a powerful dance can express different emotions. Like there was such a strong sense of community. Yes. And um, mm -hmm. if you all are familiar, like call and response is something that we see in multiple cultures. I know in Black culture, like you see that a lot, even in the music. So there won't even be any vocals, but there's this back and forth that ties people together, shows people are following each other and the the couple getting more and more involved in the mm -hmm. haka as the video went on. It's just, I was just like imagining, you know, them. that's their way of showing that they're gonna support the couple and that their community. Right, right, that they're celebrating them. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And we have one more example, and this one too. So, uh, of course, most of us are probably teachers, and this is at a boys' school, and they're honoring their retiring teacher. And so let's watch this one together. <laughs> So I don't think any one of these is any less intense than the other, uh, just in a different way. What do you think, Kelly? I, first of all, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I didn't want the video to end, but I was admiring how you could just be engulfed in the haka and there's no, there are no instruments. Like right. their voices and their bodies, their bodies the are, are the, the instruments, but there's nothing, there's nothing less about the performance, but I also, even in the, the wedding haka, I also thought about the time it takes to prepare. So I was just thinking as a teacher, I would feel so loved that they took the time to get ready. They're not just jumping up and doing that. And uh, I just thought that was so powerful, the unity they had and the time it must've taken to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that collectiveness and that ensemble uh, aspect of dance, you know, we're, we're so accustomed to that, right, so, ensemble, but it, it's a very powerful 
hold on, let me just submit some of the ensemble. And so just in this video, you know, did you see the leader? He was off to the left, you know, calling out. And once he got rolling, you know, everybody, you know, like you're indicating knows what are this, what are not the steps per se, because it's not a step dance where you've learned a routine. It's, you know, certain movements. Um, and I think, you know, just the incredible amount of emotion, emotion and respect that was evident. There's a one boy, I always look at him that's standing up, like he's so into it. He's standing up on the bench, right, to get up there. And then, you know, how do you think the retiring teacher felt about this powerful dance in his honor? I mean, he was very quiet, you know, and, and just looking at them, I would have been crying. I would have been a mess, right? <laughs> it would have been a lot. So uh, I invite you to walk through it together. This is, um, obviously these are all things that can be sourced on YouTube. And so this is a gentleman um, walking through some basic um, steps on how to do the haka. And so I invite you, I know it's been a long day. I've been sitting a lot, I'm sure a lot of you have. So if you want to, you can be cameras off, you could stand up and follow along just to get a feel for it. Because I think there's a lot of release in that uh, chanting and uh, the different movements that are happening. So I invite you if you feel comfortable to do it, but we're going to go ahead and play it. Maybe Kelly and I'll uh, stand up and walk. I'm going to mute myself. So I'll be here, but in case I want to yell, I'll be on mute. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Kia ora, everyone. Welcome to Kiwi Waka Ama and welcome to our Haka tutorial. Before we get into the words and get into learning the haka, there's a few things that we need to understand about the haka. It is something that is being handed down. We call it a taonga or a precious gift that's been handed down by our ancestors. So my ancestors before me did the haka. Uh, I do the haka. My children do the haka and my grandchildren do the haka as well too. So it's something that should be treasured. So every time we do it, we do it with respect. Uh, we do it with honor and we we don't laugh through it because it's it can be treated as a challenge to uh, to somebody. Kamata is a very famous haka in New Zealand. It's used by many many teams, it's used by many people. It's a story of We move it forward a little bit, sorry about that. Understand about the haka. It is something that is being handed down. We call it a taonga or a precious gift that's been handed down by our ancestors. So my ancestors before me did the haka. Uh, I do the haka. My children do the haka and my grandchildren do the haka as well too. So it's something that should be treasured. So every time we do it, we do it with respect. Uh, we do it with honor. And we, we don't laugh through it because it's, it can be treated as a challenge to, uh, to somebody. Kamata is a very famous haka in New Zealand. It's used by many, many teams. It's used by many people. It's a story of a chief who was trying to evade his enemies. And uh, he hid in a hole in a kumara pit he hid inside a kumara pit and a hairy man covered, yes, a hairy man covered him and his enemies ran over the top and they couldn't find him anywhere. So it's in these words here. Tenei te tangata puhuru huru. This is the hairy man, na na itiki mai whaka fiti te ra, who hit him and then when he uh, came uh, above the, the, the hole, the sun shone down on the, the chief who was hiding in the hole. So that's the story of, of Kamate. It's a very famous um, haka. The words first. Kamate, Kamate, Kaora, Kaora. Kamate, Kamate, Kaora, Kaora. Tenei te tangata puhuru, huru. Na na itiki mai whaka fiti tera A upane, kaupane A upane, kaupane fiti tera He Now we'll do the actions line by line It's easy to learn, uh, the actions aren't that difficult uh, There's only two or three actions that we need to learn 
care mi-a făcut un ochiari, te cheamă Hi! Venga Pachia! Camate, camate, ca ora, ca ora! Camate, camate, ca ora, ca ora! Tenei te tangata, uru, uru, na, na, itiki mai faca fititera! O, upa, ne, upa! Upa, ne, upa, ne, fititera! Hmm. Okay, let's do the actions. Bring a fucker on your car, eat the camel. Bring a pakia. Bring a pakia means hands on your legs. Hands hit your legs. Bring a pakia. Come at the, come at the, kaora, kaora. Kamate, kamate, kaora, kaora. Do it again. Kamate, kamate, kaora, kaora. Kamate, kamate, kaora, kaora. The next line. Tenei te tangata huru huru. Tenei te tangata huru huru. Tenei te tangata puhuru huru One more time Tenei te tangata puhuru huru So you punch your arms out Tenei te tangata And this, this arm goes in like this Puhuru huru okay, well, One thing we've got to remember When we're doing an haka We stand strong We don't stand bent over like this We stand up straight Our back straight So when you're standing, you're standing nice and solid so no one can push you over. Next line. Na na itiki mai faka fiti tera. Tenei te tangata puhuru. Huru na na itiki mai faka fiti tera. Na na itiki mai faka fiti tera. So your left hand goes up, your right hand goes underneath. Make the sunshine. Faka fiti tera means make the sunshine. Faka fiti tera. Last couple of lines. A upane kopane. Upane kopane fiti tera. It's the same, same uh, word here, same line here. So when we do faka fiti tera, faka fiti tera. Your hands already up here. Ah, uh, your left hand comes up and hits your shoulder, uh, your elbow. Ah, uh, upane, change sides, kopane. Upane, kopane, fiti tera. Remember fiti tera, you just practice that, you do that twice. Fiti tera. Right hand underneath the left hand. Huru na na itiki mai fucko fiti tera. Ah, uh, upane, kopane. Upane, kopane, fiti tera. Hi. Kiamo. Hi. Vinga pakia. Kamate, kamate, kaora, kaora. Kamate, kamate, kaora, kaora. Tene te tongata, huru, huru na na itiki mai faka fiti tera. Well, there you have it. Here's the walkthrough on that. And what did you notice, Callie? I noticed that I today was leg day at the gym. So <laughs> was, um, I like the instruction that your back is straight. Like I like the details because even though it looks simple, it's like there are specific things happening when he shared left and right. And that some of the movements had meaning. Like you said, you're bringing up the sun. Sun is shining, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the core was strong, right? Yes. 
Yeah. And so, you know, questions to ask yourself, and these are things that you would talk to your students about. How does it feel to be, you know, making slapping on your body, using your body as a percussive instrument? Is it difficult to keep track of the movements or do they flow? I think if you did it enough times, if, you know, if we had a half an hour working through it, it would start to flow. Um, does it feel strange if you're not used to it to exhibit such strong facial expressions? I think uh, we're not encouraged to do that on a daily basis, right? And then what about calling out loudly? I wasn't calling out at all because I'm in an office setting and I don't you know, want anyone to come running in here uh, wondering what's going on. But you know, that's, that's just a kind of a gentle walkthrough um, that's, that's widely available for you to be able to use. And so, um, I don't know, Callie, I think this is yes. something for you to talk about most Absolutely. appropriately. Yeah. So we go to trainings and we always try to find out how we can take it back to the classroom. And I am very fortunate. I have a dance fundamentals class, um, which is like dance appreciation. So we get to look at different styles of dance, but it helps us look at and talk about culture in a way that's very relaxed. And we get to learn about the history, um, religion and the dance. But I think it helps us get to know people and appreciate people more when we can look at culture through the lens of dance, which is how I'd love to look at everything. But as we discussed, because there is a historical, even in this tutorial, he shared um, about the history of the haka that we were going to learn. So this could be a great activity in a social studies class. Um, or if, if we're not going to get into the movement, just talking about the history through the lens of haka. And when we were doing some of the research, it also mentioned um, so some poetic aspects of the haka, probably from the lyrics, right? He showed us specifically um, what each of those phrases meant. So then that brings it into the lit class. And I'm always trying to find those um, interdisciplinary connections because it changes the classroom. It changes the direct instruction. My students did presentations on different styles of dance recently, and they did a better job than what I've been doing. <laughs> they really brought uh, their lens to the table. And at one of our high schools in Riverside Unified, they have a Polynesian club. So um, thinking about asking them to participate in our dance festival at Poly and I know that they do the haka there and maybe they would share one with us. So it's not always us having to learn how to do it, even though I thought that was fun and I would love to do that in a group, but we can also invite people in. And this is something that Louisa and I spoke about as well is inviting conversations in. We don't just have to do the research, but if we reach out to people around us because all cultures are different. And I have friends that won't talk about their culture unless you ask them. But when you do, they have so much to share. They just want to know that you're interested. So there are a lot of ways to bring this into the classroom. Louisa, do you want to add anything to that? And, and you, you touched on some great points. And I just wanted to add, a, that, to add that you said the word appreciation. And we're certainly after appreciation, not appropriation. And that's why you know we're looking at multiple um, types of dances and the background of the culture, the location of the culture, as much information around it as we can. And in the video, he said they regard this dance as a treasured possession, and that's how it should be treated with respect and honor. Um, and so I, I imagine like what I was working with younger kids, they would be, they would think it was a little bit silly at first, the eyes and the time if they were not used to it. And so they have to have all of the context around it to understand and appreciate it fully. I agree with integration, you know, how can you introduce this into a classroom and work with literature, work with social studies, work with dance, work, work with social and emotional learning, that's all possible um, the more we expand that. And I think you're right, dance fundamentals, dance appreciation, all the way up through college, this is a place where, where you're learning lots of different dances. So. Um, and then I was just doing a framework training earlier this week on the arts framework. And so we've, we've been rolling that out. And this is directly from 
the 2020 arts framework that mentions cultural dance, you know, that, you know, the teacher would mention that we're going to study a variety of, of, of dances. And we're really going to be, in the way I asked you, like, what do you notice? You know, you'd have students making observations about what char characteristics do you perceive in different dances? And how do these characteristics reveal, what do they reveal about the cultures from which they came from? And as the students respond to that, then you're weaving in the dance concepts that you pre previously learned, you're weaving the dance vocabulary. And we do a lot with um, the framework training about using like a graphic organizer to list, you know, you have space, time, energy, but you can start to make those observations specifically about dance uh, and, and doing compare and contrast. So I, it does say something there about a graphic organizer. <clears throat> and so what are some of the observational criteria you could have as you're looking at this dance and other dances from around the world? So you look at formation, physical proximity. So the physical proximity in this particular dance was very close together, right? Gestures was a huge part of this. And how would you describe it? Locomotor movement, pathways, tempo, facial expressions obviously would be huge in this, uh, instead of this particular dance. So that's straight out of the framework, which is, you know, brand new. We're in year one of it. And then a couple of resources um, online that were referenced in this presentation are uh, a couple of books here that I found. And so I'd like to point those out. And then um, this is just my promo slide at the end of all of our instructional services um, videos that we provide. So you can see I'm kind of there in the middle and I work with visual performing arts, but of course we have someone on our team that represents all of the different subject matters. So if it's something that's of interest to you, to you or your district, these are the different people to reach out to, um, to ask for help or ask for support. So at this point, you know, we're a relatively small group. Uh, Callie and I will stay, we're, we're at bed on time, we're about 420. We can stay on and um, discuss and get feedback. And maybe you wanna give suggestions and point us to our next uh, dance to look at in the series because we hope to do a couple, when, especially when Kelly gets back. I'm going to recruit her. So thank you for being here and we will hang out. Yeah, I also just want to offer just as a resource, if you have a style of dance or some um, historical activity that you're working with and you need some help, maybe tying it into another subject, I'm absolutely willing to brainstorm with you. I love when students are able to make those connections because they're always wondering how um, what we're doing applies in life. And when they can see it in more than one subject is really helpful. Absolutely. Um, hi, I'd like to kind of say something if I'm allowed. Sorry. Um, <laughs> my name's Sarah Stromberg. I'm the dance instructor at Sunnymead Middle School in Reno Valley. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for bringing this to our attention because I mean, I'm going to be honest, I've been in dance for like quite some time, but I never knew like the origins behind Hakka. That's kind of why I, you know, registered to like be a part of this today because I was like, Hakka, like I never heard it in that sense before or explained that way or knew what the cultural references and backgrounds were of that. So I just wanted to say thank you guys for bringing that to our attention today because um, I never, there's so many different things of dance that I, I know that a lot of stuff gets looked over a lot, especially in our curriculum, but um, it was it was fun. I enjoyed it. So thank you guys. Well, thanks for that feedback, Sarah. It, it's funny. I was uh, on a webinar and I was talking, I was in a breakout room with an artist in residence and she said, oh, Luisa, I just did a haka dance with my students. And that's what kicked it off for me. I'm like, what is haka dance? And I went down that rabbit hole and there are so many incredible art forms. Uh, I think sometimes as teachers, and I was definitely uh, kind of in a rut where I would present my same thing. So my background is more visual art. So I, I love George O'Keefe and I was always presenting, you know, certain artists. And then, you know, five or six years ago, I started to challenge myself to get out of that box. And sometimes it feels weird, right? It feels uncomfortable because you think, well, I'm not Polynesian or I'm not, you know, I'm not of the background. Like, is that okay? And people feel awkward or uncomfortable. But I think my goal moving forward with the series is to bring different 
um, cultural dances to the forefront and recruit people that know about it and, and put information together to just kind of open up what we're doing. Because when our students are represented, um, that's more engaging, it's, it's more powerful. And also we're adult learners. I think as teachers that opens up the world for us and there's always something new. I, in fact, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And so I'm, I'm 30 years into teaching and I got a lot to learn. So thank you for that feedback. That's, we're just dipping a toe in the water and we'd like to keep moving forward and we're open to suggestions. And in fact, my uh, assistant Rebecca will be sending out a survey presently. And if you wanna give us, if you feel shy to speak out and you wanna just give like, well, how about this? Or why don't you try this? Or, you know, uh, you can give it to us in the survey form too. We really appreciate it. It directs the work very much. Hello. I would just like to say that I really enjoyed this presentation. Um, in my class, I try to bring different um, cultural aspects for my students. And so this is something else that I'm, I will be able to you know, share with them now that I've learned a little bit more about it. So thank you very much for the presentation. That's great. Glad to hear it. And I'll just say, um, if you would like a copy of the slides, please email me and I'll send them to you directly. I don't generally send them automatically, but if it's something useful to you in your teaching practice, uh, happy to share the slides. And then this webinar is taped and will be up online uh, probably in about a week. Louisa, I love how you um, said that it's important that our students are represented and normally that's always on my brain but when we were putting this together it, it didn't cross my mind it wasn't at the forefront of my mind but sometimes it's just one student you know who can relate to our presentations and they will come and share with us and it's so wonderful and they you know it feels good so thank you for that reminder well, you know, in the arts framework um, training, we have a vignette about dance and we show a video. It's uh, Catherine Dunham and it's Haitian dance. And we're, we're asking the participants, like, what do you notice? There's a lot of isolation. There's a lot of call and response to the teacher. And then we move into an Alvin Ailey piece. Um, oh, gosh, the name is escaping me. Come to the water or something. It's very famous. And so then we see how that style of dance is incorporated into this beautiful performance but again it's just you know it, the performance is telling a story there's a baptism and, and so forth going on and, and dance uh, is a set of symbols and so you know understanding that and working with how do different cultures represent uh, and tell their stories uh, through that is really incredible so all right well I think people are starting to drop off and uh, Kim I'll send you those I'll send you those links. Remind me if I forget. I think we're good. That's a Friday wrap. Thank you. Thank Have a great weekend. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Have a great weekend. It was a joy for us to be with you.